Hey Connections, and welcome back to our series Asking for a Friend, as we're going to try uh, to conclude our message on November 10th, because this may come as a shock, but we were unable to get through everything that we never wanted to talk about. before. Nope, never. Yep, never, never had to skip anything. Yep. So we ran out of time, and you guys had some really good questions, some really good things that people even after the service were asking, yeah. some of the stuff that we were going to get back to. So before we just jump in, I want to... I want to encourage you to look up the link below this video, uh, watch the first part of this mm. this message so that you can kind of get our heart where we where we already answered some yeah, of the questions and, and just kind of got into it. But one of the things I wanted to reiterate is that we, we as a church, um, we as Christians need to start owning some of the stuff that has happened in the past. Mm. And we as Christians as a church should never condemn people. Yeah. We should never have that spirit of condemnation. And 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 and, and Dave, you pointed out uh, John 3.17 about how Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, and yeah. really, neither should we. We're here to bring hope. And so, on that note, I just, I want to say, I am sorry for how the church has treated yeah. uh, those in the LGBTQ community, um, anyone that might just be, have different beliefs than us, and, uh, and, and, and just... I'm just rambling right now. So yeah, I know, but it's a great, it's, it's, it's a great, great uh, point, Mike. It's it's like it's like Jesus said, when you love people who are just like you and agree with you and everything, that's no big deal. Right. So it's when you love people that are different from you. When it's loving people you disagree with, that's really God's kind of love. And I think the church has really kind of dropped the ball on. Yeah, that we one. have, and it just breaks my heart to see people not feel welcomed in our churches. Yeah. And, and I'm just truly sorry, and I don't ever want to come across that way and i hope connections never comes across Absolutely. that way uh, that anyone is welcome through our doors to come and worship with us as we try to help point them to god as we're trying to do that yeah, in our own that's lives right. that's right so that brings up one of the questions because i feel like a lot of people after the services came up and kind of asked some of the same things hmm. that we were going to yeah. get to in the third part because it's easy to say but for some reason as christians it can come across that we're condemning them. Even yeah. though maybe our hearts is we want to love them, we want to walk alongside of them, we, we want a relationship mm. with them. But how do we do that without necessarily maybe approving of everything they do yeah. or sending that vibe that we're against them and not for them? Yeah, that's, so, that's, that's just a, and that's just a real life issue. Oh yeah. You know, that, that we wrestle with. As I pondered that, there's a couple of reasons why I think it can be so hard not to send a condemnatory kind of a message. Mm -hmm. And and I think one is simply this. It's that some people will accept nothing less than approval. Yeah. In other words, you can accept them, you can love them, you can be kind to them, but if you don't approve of what they're doing, they're going to simply assign the label of condemnation to that, which of course isn't true, right? right. Like every parent knows, <laughs> yeah, right? Definitely, definitely. Your kids do things that you do not approve of, but you know, you still accept them and love them and right. want a relationship with them. It kind of falls, in, and there's nothing we can really do about that. Mm -hmm. But I, I think there's another way bigger reason why. I, I, I think that sometimes we Christians send tacit signals of condemnations and we're even unaware that we're actually doing it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's an explanation for that, which also opens our eyes to what it is that we can do about this matter of sending these tacit condemning signals. I think the first thing to realize is that we're all made in the image of a God who hates sin. Now, that may, that may not be the normal thing you hear about God, but it's really clear God hates sin. It says in, in the book of Habakkuk, I know your favorite book, yeah, yeah, right? the yeah, book of yeah, Habakkuk. Yeah, read it all the time. Yeah, right. Uh, it, it says in chapter 1 and verse 13 that God's eyes are too pure to look on iniquity and that, and here's exactly what he says, you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. And that word tolerate is a word that means having this visceral repulsion over sin. Mm -hmm. That's how God feels about all sin. Think about it, Mike, all sin. All Not sin. just some sins, but all It's how he feels about my sin. So like murder to lying or, or just maybe stealing an office pen. I, I don't know. No, but Something. it's exactly right. God has this visceral repulsion toward that and all sin. And of course, there's a reason why. Right. Because what God realizes, what God knows, is that sin, it 
it, it, it destroys the human heart and soul, even the minor ones as we call them. Mm -hmm. And it also destroys the relational fabric of human society. So because God understands completely the damage that all sin does, he has a repulsion toward it because of the damage it does to the object of his love, what it does to so, human beings. So sin is sin. There's not greater sin or lesser sin, but there's different consequences for sin. Like you're saying, there's the effect that it has on us. Uh, and yeah, that's a us. great point. All Basically. sin is not equal in that all sin does not damage human beings to the same degree. Gotcha. But all sin is equal because it does damage the person committing it and whoever they happen to be committed that sin too. Gotcha. So God hates the whole of it and we're made in the image of God that has a has a visceral negative reaction towards sin. But here's where the problem comes. We're we're fallen. Yeah. We're we're broken. Yeah. And that messes up. It mars the image of God in us. It doesn't remove the image of God. It just it mars the image of God. And so we become selective mm. in the sins that we have a visceral repulsion to. Right, right. So some sins are like we look at it and we go, ah, just, that makes me sick. I just hate that. And then we have other sins, usually our own. Right, right, right. Because right? we're so gracious toward our just, own just sin. Just wipe that off to the it's, side. It's, it's yeah, not, not a big good. deal, right? right? Yeah. And so we're gracious to our own sin, and yet we will have this visceral repulsion towards some sins. And I think we have a, that visceral reaction towards some sins probably for one of two reasons. One is because they're so foreign to us. We mm. can't conceive of that kind of activity and they're so foreign that we have this, are you kidding me? Right. And in other cases, it's the exact opposite. It's because it's touched us personally. Yeah. And that personal touch makes us just have this revulsion of certain kinds of sins. So we have a, a, a visceral repulsion towards sin because we're made the image of God who hates all sin because it damages human beings. But our brokenness makes us selective and we overlook some, usually our own, and then we have this big reaction toward others. Another consequence of our brokenness is that it diminishes our capacity to love like God loves. Mm -hmm. Think about it. I, I, I think this is an accurate representation of God. He looks at my sin and he has this visceral, negative, emotional response to it because he sees the damage it's doing. And yet... He doesn't condemn me. He moves toward me. Yeah. In love, he wants to heal me and help me. And if we're really operating out of the image of God, that love is going to be so powerful toward other human beings that it that it overcomes that visceral reaction and says, I'm going to move toward you in love and compassion because you matter so much and I'm going to try to help you. But man, that, that part of this is broken as well. So two things come to mind when you say that. One is that quote that I mentioned with Timothy Keller. I mean, like that's, that's, that's God, one. right? That he, he fully knows everything about us Yes, and yet still chooses to love us. That's and that is so hard quote. for us as fallen people to do sometimes because yeah. it's easy to want to retaliate or for whatever reasons, not love that yeah, person. Absolutely. The other thing I was thinking, it's interesting that maybe it's easy for us to have compassion on people when we can relate with the sin or that struggle that's or whatever that point. is. And it becomes a little bit harder for us to have compassion when we just have no that is idea a great point, Mike. of how to relate with that person yeah. in that situation. Yeah, so. again, it's easy to show mercy to people in areas where we need mercy. Right. Really hard in areas where maybe we don't, but somebody else does. I yeah. think that's a great point. Yeah. So I, I, here's, a, here's a question I have that I think is critically important. How do we as followers of Jesus deal with that brokenness inside of us that has this selectiveness when it comes to our visceral negative reaction against some sins and the diminishment of our ability to love people to have that. In other words, how do we become more like God in being able to really hate sin across the board, particularly our own, and love enough to be able to actually move toward other people in a, in a way that shows friendship, acceptance, and support? Uh, it's, that's, that's a great question because we're going to have the opportunity or we're going to come across people that obviously we disagree with mm -hmm. on yep. a whole gambit of different things. So I think the first thing someone needs to do is first just recognize that feeling that comes up inside yeah, of where yeah. I either want to puff up or I, I'm already thinking through verses or how this is wrong. So that's not righteous indignation. No, no. Usually there. that's your first flag that you got to <laughs> yeah. not suppress it or not, you know, your convictions, but you need to at least acknowledge that it's there. Yeah. Uh, be aware of it. 
But then I'm going to challenge you to, first of all, maybe affirm that person in some way mm. that, hey, I'm here for you. I want to listen to your story. I love you if that's appropriate. Whatever the, wherever so the level if, is. So if I affirm someone, let's say someone who's gay, or it doesn't matter what sin they're involved in, right? If I affirm them, aren't I just approving of what it is that yeah. they're doing? No. And it goes back to just the example of a parent. I love my kids and I'm going to affirm them uh, even when they do something wrong. Uh, and they're yeah. going to know that I love them because I'm there for them. I want to be mm. a safe place. Now, I might not approve of what they just did, yeah. uh, the choice that they made, but I still love them. Yeah. Uh, I still care about them and want what's best for them. So, so this is an important point to make is that acceptance of a person does not equal approval of everything that person right. does. Yeah. Right. Like just not everyone's going to accept or approve everything I do. Even as a pastor, we still struggle and mess up. I right? certainly don't. Right. 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 Yeah. It's my boss. I know yeah. you don't. Um, uh, but uh, no, just, but it, yeah, we can still love people without necessarily giving our stamp of approval on everything they yeah. do. So just affirm them in whatever the appropriate way would be. Mm -hmm. And then I want people to listen. Not listen mm. and think of all the ammo that you can use to combat that statement or whatever yeah. they're going through, but to just truly listen. Where is this person coming from? What are the things that they're wrestling with? Imagine telling mm. someone that you love, someone that you trust, this thing that you're wrestling with, whatever it may be, not knowing how they're going to respond. That mm. can be a really hard thing to Seriously. do. And to have someone just say, yeah, I love you anyway, and I'm just going to listen. Mm. And maybe listening and ask questions, not questions to feed your own agenda, but questions to say, hey, what's it like to wrestle with that? What's it like to be on the other end of people's, let's call it hate crimes like we do, mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. discrimination, or to, to lose a job because of something that you're into? What is that? Mm -hmm. What's it like to be you? How long have you wrestled with this? Um, you know, what, what, who have you shared this with? What have been the responses? Just ask questions and make it about them. They'll make the questions about yeah. you and really try to walk a mile in their shoe. And, and here's the thing, don't just ask questions through a text or one, you know, we had coffee for 10 minutes and now we're good. Yeah. It might take a couple weeks, a couple months, who knows, but just spend some time asking those questions. They probably already know your viewpoint. Mm, they probably yeah. already know your stance. Yeah. They're not looking for you to add to that. I'm not saying you never bring those things up, uh, but we should do it to help restore them back to God mm -hmm. when the Spirit leads the appropriate times mm -hmm. to have this. Because here's the thing. When we can affirm and we can ask questions, we start to build trust or rebuild trust yeah. in, a, in a relationship. Yeah. And as I build that trust and that rapport, then it allows me some space to ask those hard questions. Mm. Then it allows me that space to dig deeper into some of those things because now you know that I'm for you, not against you. Yeah, you know that good. I love you and that's that I good. trust you. Now we can get to some of those mm -hmm. things. So don't just make it a quick, oh, we talked for 10 minutes. Now you're going to listen to the next 40 yeah. minutes of what I have to say. I listened to you. So now let me give you my spiel right, right. Right? about yeah, about how it is. That's, that, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a really good concept. We, we sometimes say at Connections that relationships are the bridges over which ministry travels. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a relationship with someone, you're not going to have any influence in any, in any way o over or on a person's particular right. life. So as just as I see Jesus building relationships by just caring about the everyday situation of human beings which then created an environment in which there was at least a willingness to listen. I hear you're saying we should kind of model that same thing in our own lives. Yeah, model that and, and it's okay. You might wrestle with some stuff. Here's the idea. Go talk to someone else and say, here's what I'm wrestling with. I don't know how to approach mm. this or I don't agree with this and how do I show it with love? But don't do it to that person in that moment that's sitting across yeah. from you sharing their soul or unloading this burden. Mike, what about when they just make offhanded comments? Like you're talking and suddenly this person you're talking with goes, um, yeah, you know, I, 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 you're talking to a guy and he goes, I, yeah, I was on a date last night with my boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And it just goes on. What, 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 how do you respond when people make those offhanded comments when you, you realize that they're revealing in some way mm -hmm. something about their sexuality? That's, like a, that. that's a great question because the first thing is you want to do is not react. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, don't spit out your drink. Don't. <laughs> Uh, you know, stop the conversation. Just listen again uh, and ask questions. It's the same as if um, a friend of mine was dating someone of the opposite sex. I would ask them questions. How's yeah. your girlfriend? How's yeah. your boyfriend? How are they doing? What are they learning? How are they treating you? Ask those same questions. Mm. They still are a person made in God's image and crave community. 
And I would hope I'm still going to love that person and want someone to treat them with respect and yeah. dignity. And, yeah. and so maybe just ask the same questions you would ask someone uh, that would be dating someone of the opposite sex. Mm. And it lets them know how oh, well, you actually care about me as a person, yeah. that I actually have hopes and dreams that you're yeah. going to acknowledge and see me as a whole person mm -hmm. and not just this one thing and let it define me in that yeah. area. Yeah, so that's good. Yeah, and so that's one of the ways affirming, listening, spending time with them. What what are what do you think, Dave, are some other ways that we can help mm. show? Because it, again, it, it can be really hard. Yeah, to, very. Um, something just experienced from my own life. Um, I have found that honest, um, Holy Spirit involved introspection is hugely important in this whole matter. Mm -hmm. Because when I allow the Spirit of God to reveal things in my life that are out of whack with what God wants for me, when I let him point out those sins and take them seriously, that has an impact on how I view other people. Because I become more acutely aware of how sinful I am. It, it, I, I've, I've made this statement before, it, it is so true. I am more aware of how big a sinner I am now after having been a Christian for 40 years. That's a long time. It's a long time. It's amazing I'm still alive. You got saved when you were two, right? Uh, well, uh, actually, I got saved in utero, Mike. Oh, I wasn't right. even born right. yet. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I'm more aware now of how a bigger sinner I am than I was the day that I came to faith in Jesus and asked him to save me from my sin. Because in my growing of, of, of my understanding of God and his purity and his standard and his will, I realize I have fallen so far short. And when I allow the Spirit of God to deal with me about those things, it changes my, it humbles me and it makes me so less internally condemnatory towards someone else who's in the same boat I am in. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe the Apostle Paul practiced this. And what did he call himself? He said, I am the chief of sinners. Yeah. He wasn't just blowing smoke there, right? He yeah. wasn't just, oh, I'm going to make a statement of false humility. He was going, I have gotten so close to God, I realize how big a sinner I am. And that made him non-condemnatory -condemn toward everybody mm -hmm. else. M remember the passage where Jesus said that... Um, that we we need to deal with the beam in our own eye before we're about to splinter in someone else. And he's saying, you take care of your junk, okay, and make that your priority, not somebody else's stuff. I think there's something extremely healthy that happens when we honestly and openly deal with our own stuff on a regular basis before God and our own sin. And what it does is it not just helps us to overcome those things, it also changes the way we view all sinners, yeah, and, yeah. and that's what we all are, right? right? And it changes it so that now when I'm helping someone else with any struggle they may happen to have, I don't come as a moral superior to a moral inferior, but as a fellow struggler going, yeah. dude, it may not be in the same area, but I get the battle. And that helps to take away some of that that. Air, air of superiority and judgment that can sometimes come from well-meaning Christians because they're not dealing with their own junk in an appropriate way. So just to maybe summarize in, in a statement or two, what I hear you saying is that like it's about the progress that we're on, not necessarily yeah. our destination or where we think we are at that moment. We're both on a journey. We're, we're both, both on progressing. A journey, right? Not how much farther we have to go. It's where we come from dealing with the stuff we're in now. Absolutely. And, the, and if our stuff is different from somebody else, it's still stuff. Yeah. It's still yeah. stuff that would be dealt with. That's why I, I think that inclusiveness is such an important value or ethic for the individual Christian like myself, for the community of Christians, the church, to be able to practice. Because the church should be the most inclusive organization in the world. You know, God says, whosoever will may come. I mean, anybody who wants to, everybody is allowed to come into the community. But in that community, it, it's, a, it's a community of broken people who acknowledge their own brokenness and who are together trying to follow Jesus and pursue his will and grow in the understanding of him 
and grow in our capacity to be more like him and as we work through life. So we're a broken, repentant community trying to learn and change and grow, and I think we can all do that together. So we should be the most inclusive organization on earth right. as Christians because we recognize our universal brokenness and the one who heals all brokenness, and that's Jesus. So I, I love what you're saying there, the inclusiveness, and I think we need to remember too as Christians, just to add to that, like we don't always have to just invite them to church. Like maybe yeah, invite yeah. them to your home. And I'm not talking just about LGBTQ plus community. I'm talking about anyone with Anybody. differences that yeah. or wrestling, whether it's addiction, whether it's greed or pride, uh, whatever it may be, um, to maybe invite them in your home for a dinner or be willing to go to their home if they invite mm -hmm. you or to a coffee shop that they enjoy or do something that they like also. Maybe make yourself a little uncomfortable going into their environment to, to show the, the love of Jesus. Because I, I always think of uh, mm. Jesus when he interacts with Zacchaeus, who's a tax collector, yeah. who's like not yep. liked at all in that population in that time. And, and what does Jesus do? He tells him to come down. He calls him by name, lets him know yep. that he's known, and then says, hey, today I'm going to eat at your I'm house. i go to your house, yeah. And so that was like radically mind-blowing at the time. That no, Jesus, we, and we don't realize how radical what Jesus did because there's no way the re religious establishment would have thought about going to Zacchaeus. He was too big of a sinner. Yeah, yeah. So he went to his home. He didn't have Zacchaeus come to his place or where, he, where yeah. his apostles that's were hanging good. out. That's good. And so I think that's a good remembrance for us when it comes to inclusiveness. It's, mm -hmm. it's not just the church. It's every circle that it's you're in. It's everybody. Yeah. Uh, where you're at. So yeah, that's, that's good cool. Input. Any final thoughts, Mike? No, I'm just thankful, uh, again, that Connections, we're doing this asking for a friend. If you have questions, you can go to the app, find yeah. the tile that says asking for a friend, and you can ask anything you want. It's anonymous, um, and we're going to be tackling these things, whether it's in this video format again in the future or a series at the church, um, because we're, we're Connections. I mean, we want to be a place where you can come and ask yeah. hard questions, yeah. any questions, simple questions, hard questions. I'll take the simple, he can take the hard. <laughs> um, but the hard <laughs> questions where we can have dialogue and it's okay to have doubts and questions because yeah. doubts, That's again, right. doesn't mean we don't believe. It just means we're we're unsure of which That's way to right. go That's with right. these things. And so just thankful that we could have this conversation as, as you and myself and the rest of the staff, we're wrestling through these That's things right. and challenging ourselves and trying, right. you know, and hopefully, you know, this was helpful for you. Uh, as we move forward. Yeah, absolutely. So we're growing and we invite anybody and everybody to just grow along with us, yep. right, as we learn to follow Jesus. So why don't, why don't we pray, Mike? All right, right, sounds good. Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you that Jesus is the answer. He's the healer. He is light and he is life. Help each one of us to understand him better, to deepen our faith in and love for Jesus and may we grow in our capacity to allow him to have his way in us and then to do his will through us to be a blessing to everyone in the world. We ask in Jesus' name.